Hi boys and girls, welcome out to our uh, first half of the most dangerous game. Actually this video will be a, the longer half because we're going to take the uh, the story, the climax of the story is almost dead center in the, in the book. We're going to take ourselves up to that point. You'll find that a lot of the uh, conflict in the story is more external conflict in the beginning of the story and towards the second half um, our main character Rainsford has to deal with more internal conflict. I'd like you on your page uh, 12 and 13 in your book and what I'm going to do is preview the text a little bit here and then set you up for the reading. Please, uh, on page 12, if you take a look at that, it's much better to have your textbook at home uh, than just using this. However, I did find the text online, so I will be able to refer to the text and uh, scroll through it as, your, uh, as, as the video is going on and highlight a few things here as we begin. But um, what I want you to do is take a look in your book because the book has side notes, footnotes, um, different things to help you with previewing the text. For example, on page 12, it takes a look at uh, the conflict in the story, telling you what internal and external conflict is. And um, those are important things to take a look at before you read the text, as well as predicting just the title. It says on page 12, uh, predict the title. What does it mean? Uh, what do you predict the conflict will be in here? Our title, The Most Dangerous Game, uh, I think of something as a game as, as something some people to see as fun, but uh, does danger, is danger an element that we need to add in order to have fun? Um, you know, uh, maybe that, that would draw you into, into that kind of game, right? So um, the most dangerous game, what kind of game will we play that's, uh, that, that, that entices a, a little bit of danger? Uh, next, when we're looking at our book, um, you will have vocabulary words on the bottom of the pages. Please pay attention to those. Uh, we will have a vocab list that we'll do in class together, and we will be taking vocab tests during this unit, two of them. So um, our first word, palpable, too, uh, at, at page 13, at the bottom it says, easily felt or touched. I have it up here on my screen. It says Rainsford, our main character, is trying to peer through the dank tropical night that was palpable as it pressed its thick, warm blackness upon the yacht. Palpable, easily felt. So the night is easily felt. It's a concept that's kind of a little bit hard to understand, but what a great word choice. Can you feel the night? If it's night, it's tropical and, and you know, humid and it, it, and the darkness of the night is easily felt. It's just this great word choice to build suspense. We'll see the author doing that a lot throughout this uh, these first couple pages. If you turn to page 14 as well, then some uh, similes and um, in, take a look at this line here. There was no breeze. The sea was as flat as a plate, plate glass window. Uh, our two main characters, Whitney and Rainsford here, are going on a hunting expedition. They're on a yacht in the Caribbean Sea. And the, the plate glass window just allows that ship to go really fast. You can't really see uh, ships that might crash, or waves that might crash on a rock. Uh, similar to the Titanic, you may know that that night was very uh, no wind and very flat. Uh, able to, for the yacht to move fast, but it can be a little bit dangerous too. So uh, a great simile there. Uh, he heard the muttering and growling of the sea breaking on the rocky shore. Okay, so as he's getting close to the shore, the sea is growling in there, and that's personification. You know, the sea feels alive. The sea feels like a like an actual character in the story here because of this personification. So just keep an eye on the things that the author does to build the suspense for this text. Okay, uh, it says uh, a 22. He remarked. Um, that's odd. It must have been a fairly large animal, too. The hunter had his nerve to tackle it with a light gun. Okay? Even if I don't know what a 22 is, I know that this person is apparently hunting fairly large animal um, from whatever the the, uh, the hints are in the text. And he uses a 22. Now, for those of you who are hunters, you know that this is a, a 22 slug. It's a good thing we're doing this um, on online here because I would never be able to bring this something like this into school. But this is a 22. This is the head, this is the slug, the bullet part that would actually be used. If you're hunting large animal with this, you're probably either insane or a very good hunter. Um, you need to get very close to make a kill with something like this, and you have to know where to shoot. Uh, this is what I would hunt a large game with. Oop, sorry about that. But that was a big bang. It's because a slug just fell on my computer. This is a, uh, a slug that you would use to hunt deer, and that's the size of the bullet compared to the 22. So anyway... Uh, again, the author saying that you know the the he finds a 22 shell shows me that they're using a very small caliber gun when you would use something that for, like that for large game. So, and I said the word game, yes, but large game. Um, okay, one more thing about word choice I wanted to point out is that um, he talks about the Caribbean Sea here, the Caribbean Sea, 
um, as blood warm waters, okay? When I think about the Caribbean Sea, I know I want to go on vacation, right? And I'm thinking tropical water is nice and warm, but blood warm, how warm is that water exactly? I'm thinking like 98.6 degrees, right? So I would think that's got to be awesome to have really nice, beautiful water, but when you get in this water, sometimes it's not refreshing. Sometimes it's you know, it's almost like a little too hot and blood warm waters. Just again, the word choice the author uses. We're building suspense throughout this whole work. So watch that as we're reading, okay? Um, anyway, what I'm going to do right now is uh, start up the audio text. And I've got that on my word player here. So if you want to pause the video and just do the reading on your own, we are going to be reading up to page 23 in this first uh, lesson here page 23. You're going to go to the end of page 23, and that's going to be about 37 minutes of The Most Dangerous Game. We'll only have 19 minutes for the second uh, lesson here. But again, this is only about a good five minutes here at the beginning, about 10 minutes at the end. We'll have 15 minutes of lesson for each one of our lessons here. But I prefer to read this text with the audio text as well. I'm an auditory learner. So if you're like me, um, continue to play the video, and I'm going to scroll up to the top and continue to scroll through the story here. Um, so that in case you don't have your textbook at home, you at least have the text in front of you and you can listen to the audio text as well. Enjoy the story, boys and girls, and I will see you in 37 minutes. The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Carnell. Off there to the right, somewhere, is a large island, said Whitney. It's rather a mystery. What island is it? Rainsford asked. The old charts call it Ship Trap Island, Whitney replied. A suggestive name, isn't it? Sailors have a curious dread of the place. I don't know why. Some superstition. Can't see it, remarked Rainsford, trying to peer through the dank tropical night that was palpable as it pressed its thick, warm blackness in upon the yacht. You've good eyes, said Whitney, with a laugh. And I've seen you pick off a moose moving in the brown fall bush at 400 yards, but even you can't see four miles or so through a moonless Caribbean night. Nor four yards, admitted Rainsford. Huh. It's like moist black velvet. It will be light in Rio, promised Whitney. We should make it in a few days. I hope the Jaguar guns have come from Purdy's. We should have some good hunting up the Amazon. Great sport hunting. The best sport in the world, agreed Rainsford. For the hunter, amended Whitney, not for the jaguar. Don't talk rot, Whitney, said Rainsford. You're a big game hunter, not a philosopher. Who cares how a jaguar feels? Perhaps the jaguar does, observed Whitney. Bah! They've no understanding. Even so, I rather think they understand one thing, fear. The fear of pain and the fear of death. Nonsense, laughed Rainsford. This hot weather is making you soft, Whitney. Be a realist. The world is made up of two classes, the hunters and the huntees. Luckily, you and I are the hunters. Do you think we've passed that island yet? I can't tell in the dark. I hope so. Why? asked Rainsford. The place has a reputation, a bad one. Cannibals, suggested Rainsford. Hardly. Even cannibals wouldn't live in such a godforsaken place. But it's gotten into sailor lore somehow. Didn't you notice that the crew's nerves seemed a bit jumpy today? They were a bit strange, now you mention it. Even Captain Nielsen. Yes. Even that tough-minded old Swede who'd go up to the devil himself and ask him for a light. Those fishy blue eyes held a look I never saw there before. All I could get out of him was, This place has an evil name among seafaring men, sir. Then he said to me very gravely, Don't you feel anything? As if the air about us was actually poisonous. Now you mustn't laugh when I tell you this. I did feel something like a sudden chill. There was no breeze. The sea was as flat as a plate glass window. We were drawing near the island then. What I felt was a... a mental chill. A sort of sudden dread. Pure imagination, said Rainsford. One superstitious sailor can taint the whole ship's company with his fear. 
Maybe. But sometimes I think sailors have an extra sense that tells them when they are in danger. Sometimes I think evil is a tangible thing, with wavelengths, just as sound and light have. An evil place can, so to speak, broadcast vibrations of evil. Anyhow, I'm glad we're getting out of this zone. Well, I think I'll turn in now, Rainsford. I'm not sleepy, said Rainsford. I'm going to smoke another pipe on the after deck. Good night, then, Rainsford. See you at breakfast. Right. Good night, Whitney. There was no sound in the night as Rainsford sat there, but the muffled throb of the engine that drove the yacht swiftly through the darkness and the swish and ripple of the wash of the propeller. Rainsford, reclining in a steamer chair, indolently puffed on his favorite briar. The sensuous drowsiness of the night was on him. It's so dark, he thought, that I could sleep without closing my eyes. The night would be my eyelids. An abrupt sound startled him. Off to the right he heard it, and his ears, expert in such matters, could not be mistaken. Again he heard the sound, and again. Somewhere, off in the blackness, someone had fired a gun three times. Rainsford sprang up and moved quickly to the rail, mystified. He strained his eyes in the direction from which the reports had come, but it was like trying to see through a blanket. He leaped upon the rail and balanced himself there to get greater elevation. His pipe, striking a rope, was not from his mouth. He lunged for it. A short, hoarse cry came from his lips as he realized he had reached too far and had lost his balance. The cry was pinched off short as the blood-warm waters of the Caribbean Sea closed over his head. He struggled up to the surface and tried to cry out, but the wash from the speeding yacht slapped him in the face, and the salt water in his open mouth made him gag and strangle. Desperately he struck out with strong strokes after the receding lights of the yacht, but he stopped before he had swum fifty feet. A certain cool-headedness had come to him, it was not the first time he had been in a tight place. There was a chance that his cries could be heard by someone aboard the yacht, but that chance was slender and grew more slender as the yacht raced on. He wrestled himself out of his clothes and shouted with all his power. The lights of the yacht became faint and ever-vanishing fireflies. Then they were blotted out entirely by the night. Rainsford remembered the shots. They had come from the right, and doggedly he swam in that direction, swimming with slow, deliberate strokes, conserving his strength. For a seemingly endless time he fought the sea. He began to count his strokes. He could do possibly a hundred more, and then... Rainsford heard a sound. It came out of the darkness, a high, screaming sound, the sound of an animal in an extremity of anguish and terror. He did not recognize the animal that made the sound. He did not try to. With fresh vitality he swam toward the sound. He heard it again. Then it was cut short by another noise. Crisp, staccato. Pistol shot, muttered Rainsford, swimming on. Ten minutes of determined effort brought another sound to his ears, the most welcome he had ever heard. The muttering and growling of the sea breaking on a rocky shore. He was almost on the rocks before he saw them. On a night less calm, he would have been shattered against them. With his remaining strength, he dragged himself from the swirling waters. Jagged crags appeared to jut into the opaqueness. He forced himself upward, hand over hand. Gasping, his hands raw, he reached a flat place at the top. Dense jungle came down to the very edge of the cliffs. What perils that tangle of trees and underbrush might hold for him did not concern Rainsford just then. All he knew was that he was safe from his enemy, the sea, and that utter weariness was on him. He flung himself down at the jungle edge and tumbled headlong into the deepest sleep of his life. When he opened his eyes, he knew from the position of the sun that it was late in the afternoon. Sleep had given him new vigor. A sharp hunger was picking at him. He looked about him, almost cheerfully. 
Where there are pistol shots, there are men. Where there are men, there is food, he thought. But what kind of men, he wondered, in so forbidding a place? An unbroken front of snarled and ragged jungle fringed the shore. He saw no sign of a trail through the closely knit web of weeds and trees. It was easier to go along the shore, and Rainsford floundered along by the water. Not far from where he had landed, he stopped. Some wounded thing, by the evidence of a large animal, had thrashed about in the underbrush. The jungle weeds were crushed down and the moss was lacerated. One patch of weeds was stained crimson. A small, glittering object not far away caught Rainsford's eye, and he picked it up. It was an empty cartridge. A twenty-two, he remarked. That's odd. It must have been a fairly large animal, too. The hunter had his nerve with him to tackle it with a light gun. It's clear that the brute put up a fight. I suppose the first three shots I heard was when the hunter flushed his quarry and wounded it. The last shot was when he trailed it here and finished it. He examined the ground closely and found what he had hoped to find, the print of hunting boots. They pointed along the cliff in the direction he had been going. Eagerly he hurried along, now slipping on a rotten log or a loose stone, but making headway. Night was beginning to settle down on the island. Bleak darkness was blacking out the sea and jungle when Rainsford sighted the lights. He came upon them as he turned a crook in the coastline, and his first thought was that he had come upon a village, for there were many lights. But as he forged along, he saw to his great astonishment that all the lights were in one enormous building, a lofty structure with pointed towers plunging upward into the gloom. His eyes made out the shadowy outlines of a palatial chateau, it was set on a high bluff, and on three sides of it cliffs dived down to where the sea licked greedy lips in the shadows. Mirage, thought Rainsford, but it was no mirage he found when he opened the tall spiked iron gate. The stone steps were real enough. The massive door with a leering gargoyle for a knocker was real enough. Yet about it all hung an air of unreality. He lifted the knocker, and it creaked up stiffly, as if it had never before been used. He let it fall, and it startled him with its booming loudness. He thought he heard steps within. The door remained closed. Again, Rainsford lifted the heavy knocker and let it fall. The door opened then, opened as suddenly as if it were on a spring and Rainsford stood blinking in the river of glaring gold light that poured out. The first thing Rainsford's eyes discerned was the largest man Rainsford had ever seen, a gigantic creature solidly made and black-bearded to the waist. In his hand, the man held a long-barreled revolver, and he was pointing it straight at Rainsford's heart. Out of the snarl of beard, two small eyes regarded Rainsford, don't be alarmed, said Rainsford, with a smile which he hoped was disarming. I am no robber. I fell off a yacht. My name is Sanger Rainsford of New York City. The menacing look in the eyes did not change. The revolver pointed as rigidly as if the giant were a statue. He gave no sign that he understood Rainsford's words, or that he had even heard them. He was dressed in uniform a black uniform trimmed with gray astrakhan. I'm Sanger Rainsford of New York, Rainsford began again. I fell off a yacht. I am hungry. The man's only answer was to raise with his thumb the hammer of his revolver. Then Rainsford saw the man's free hand go to his forehead in a military salute, and he saw him click his heels together and stand at attention. Another man was coming down the broad marble steps an erect, slender man in evening clothes. He advanced to Rainsford and held out his hand. In a cultivated voice marked by a slight accent that gave it added precision and deliberateness, he said, It is a very great pleasure and honor to welcome Mr. Sanger Rainsford, the celebrated hunter, to my home. Automatically, Rainsford shook the man's hand. 
I have read your book about hunting snow leopards in Tibet, you see, explained the man. I am General Zaroff. Rainsford's first impression was that the man was singularly handsome. His second was that there was an original, almost bizarre quality about the general's face. He was a tall man, past middle age, for his hair was a vivid white, but his thick eyebrows and pointed military mustache were as black as the night from which Rainsford had come. His eyes, too, were black and very bright. He had high cheekbones, a sharp-cut nose, a spare, dark face, the face of a man used to giving orders, the face of an aristocrat. Turning to the giant in uniform, the general made a sign. The giant put away his pistol, saluted, withdrew. Ivan is an incredibly strong fellow, remarked the general. But he has the misfortune to be deaf and dumb. A simple fellow, but I am afraid, like all his race, a bit of a savage. Is he Russian? He is a Cossack, said the general, and his smile showed red lips and pointed teeth. So am I. Come, he said. We shouldn't be chatting here. We can talk later. Now you want clothes, food, rest. You shall have them. This is a most restful spot. Ivan had reappeared, and the general spoke to him with lips that moved, but gave forth no sound. "'Follow Ivan, if you please, Mr. Rainsford,' said the general. "'I was about to have my dinner when you came. I'll wait for you. You'll find that my clothes will fit you, I think.' It was to a huge beam-ceiling bedroom with a canopied bed big enough for six men that Rainsford followed the silent giant. Ivan laid out an evening suit, and Rainsford, as he put it on, noticed that it came from a London tailor who ordinarily cut and sewed for none below the rank of Duke. The dining room to which Ivan conducted him was in many ways remarkable. There was a medieval magnificence about it. It suggested a baronial hall of feudal times, with its oaken panels, its high ceiling its vast refectory table where two score men could sit down to eat. About the hall were the mounted heads of many animals. Lions, tigers, elephants, moose, bears. Larger or more perfect specimens Rainsford had never seen. At the great table the general was sitting alone. You'll half a cocktail, Mr. Rainsford, he suggested. The cocktail was surpassingly good, and Rainsford noted the table appointments were of the finest. The linen, the crystal, the silver, the china. They were eating borscht, the rich red soup, with sour cream so dear to Russian palates. Half apologetically, General Zarov said, We do our best to preserve the amenities of civilization here. Please forgive any lapses. We are well off the beaten track, you know. Do you think the Champagne has suffered from its long ocean trip? Not in the least, declared Rainsford. He was finding the general a most thoughtful and affable host, a true cosmopolite. But there was one small trait of the general's that made Rainsford uncomfortable. Whenever he looked up from his plate, he found the general studying him, appraising him narrowly. Perhaps, said General Zaroff, you were surprised that I recognized your name. You see, I read all books on hunting published in English, French, and Russian. I have but one passion in my life, Mr. Rainsford, and it is the hunt. You have some wonderful heads here, said Rainsford, as he ate a particularly well-cooked filet mignon. That Cape Buffalo is the largest I ever saw. Oh, that fellow, yes. He was a monster. Did he charge you? Hurled me against a tree, said the general. Fractured my skull, but I got the brute. I've always thought, said Rainsford, that the Cape Buffalo is the most dangerous of all big game. For a moment, the general did not reply. He was smiling his curious red-lipped smile. Then he said slowly, No. You're wrong, sir. The Cape Buffalo is not the most dangerous big game. He sipped his wine. 
Here in my preserve on this island, he said in the same slow tone, I hunt more dangerous game. Rainsford expressed his surprise. Is there big game on this island? The general nodded. The biggest. Really? Oh, it isn't here naturally, of course. I have to stock the island. What have you imported, General? Rainsford asked. Tigers? The general smiled. No, he said. Hunting tigers ceased to interest me some years ago. I exhausted their possibilities, you see. No thrill left in tigers, no real danger. I live for danger, Mr. Rainsford. The general took from his pocket a gold cigarette case and offered his guest a long black cigarette with a silver tip. It was perfumed and gave off a smell like incense. We will have some capital hunting, you and I, said the general. I shall be most glad to have your society. But what came? began Rainsford. I'll tell you, said the general. You will be amused, I know. I think I may say, in all modesty, that I have done a rare thing. I have invented a new sensation. May I pour you another glass of port, Mr. Rainsford? Thank you, General. The General filled both glasses and said, God makes some men poets. Some he makes kings, some beggars. Me, he made a hunter. My hand was made for the trigger, my father said. He was a very rich man with a quarter of a million acres in the Crimea, and he was an ardent sportsman. When I was only five years old, he gave me a little gun specially made in Moscow for me to shoot sparrows with. When I shot some of his prized turkeys with it, he did not punish me. He complimented me on my marksmanship. I killed my first bear in the Caucasus when I was ten. My whole life has been one prolonged hunt. I went into the army. It was expected of noblemen's sons and for a time commanded a division of Cossack cavalry, but my real interest was always the hunt. I have hunted every kind of game in every land. It would be impossible for me to tell you how many animals I have killed. The general puffed at his cigarette. After the debacle in Russia, I left the country, for it was imprudent for an officer of the Tsar to stay there. Many noble Russians lost everything. I, luckily, had invested heavily in American securities, so I shall never have to open a tea room in Monte Carlo or drive a taxi in Paris. Naturally, I continued to hunt. Grizzlies in your Rockies, crocodiles in the Ganges, rhinoceroses in East Africa. It was in Africa that the Cape Buffalo hit me and laid me up for six months. As soon as I recovered, I started for the Amazon to hunt jaguars, for I had heard they were unusually cunning. They weren't. The Cossack sighed. They were no match at all for a hunter with his wits about him and a high-powered rifle. I was bitterly disappointed. I was lying in my tent with a splitting headache one night when a terrible thought pushed its way into my mind. Hunting was beginning to bore me. And hunting, remember, had been my life. I have heard that in America, businessmen often go to pieces when they give up the business that has been their life. Yes, that's so, said Rainsford. The general smiled. I had no wish to go to pieces, he said. I must do something. Now, mine is an analytical mind, Mr. Rainsford. Doubtless that is why I enjoy the problems of the chase. No doubt, General Zaroff. So, continued the general, I asked myself why the hunt no longer fascinated me. You are much younger than I am, Mr. Rainsford, and have not hunted as much, but you perhaps can guess the answer. What was it? Simply this. Hunting had ceased to be what you call a sporting proposition. It had become too easy. I always got my quarry. Always. There is no greater bore than perfection. The general lit a fresh cigarette. No animal had a chance with me anymore. That is no boast, 
It is a mathematical certainty. The animal had nothing but his legs and his instinct. Instinct is no match for reason. When I thought of this, it was a tragic moment for me, I can tell you. Rainsford leaned across the table, absorbed in what his host was saying. It came to me as an inspiration what I must do, the general went on. And that was? The general smiled, the quiet smile of one who has faced an obstacle and surmounted it with success. I had to invent a new animal to hunt, he said. A new animal? You're joking. Not at all, said the general. I never joke about hunting. I needed a new animal. I found one. So I bought this island, built this house, and here I do my hunting. The island is perfect for my purposes. There are jungles with a maze of trails in them, hills, swamps. But the animal, General Zaroff. Oh, said the general. It supplies me with the most exciting hunting in the world. No other hunting compares with it for an instant. Every day I hunt, and I never grow bored now, for I have a quarry with which I can match my wits. Rainsford's bewilderment showed in his face. I wanted the ideal animal to hunt, explained the general. So I said, what are the attributes of an ideal quarry? And the answer was, of course, it must have courage, cunning, and above all, it must be able to reason. But no animal can reason, objected Rainsford. My dear fellow, said the general, there is one that can. But you can't mean, gasped Rainsford. And why not? I can't believe you are serious, General Zaroff. This is a grisly joke. Why should I not be serious? I am speaking of hunting. Hunting? Good God, General Zaroff. What you speak of is murder. The general laughed with entire good nature. He regarded Rainsford quizzically. I refuse to believe that so modern and civilized a young man as you seem to be harbors romantic ideas about the value of human life. Surely your experiences in the war did not make me condone cold-blooded murder, finished Rainsford stiffly. Laughter shook the general. <laughs> How extraordinarily droll you are, he said. One does not expect nowadays to find a young man of the educated class, even in America, with such a naive end, if I may say so mid-Victorian point of view. It's like finding a snuff-box in a limousine. Ah, well, doubtless you had Puritan ancestors. So many Americans appear to have had. I'll wager you'll forget your notions when you go hunting with me. You've a genuine new thrill in store for you, Mr. Rainsford. Thank you. I'm a hunter, not a murderer. Dear me said the general, quite unruffled. Again, that unpleasant word. But I think I can show you that your scruples are quite ill-founded. Yes? Life is for the strong, to be lived by the strong, and if need be, taken by the strong. The weak of the world were put here to give the strong pleasure. I am strong. Why should I not use my gift? If I wish to hunt, why should I not? I hunt the scum of the earth, sailors from tramp ships, Blaskers, blacks, Chinese, whites, mongrels. A thoroughbred horse or hound is worth more than a score of them. But they are men, said Rainsford hotly. Precisely, said the general. That is why I use them. It gives me pleasure. They can reason after a fashion, so they are dangerous. Where do you get them? The general's left eyelid fluttered down in a wink. This island is called Ship Trap, he answered. Sometimes an angry god of the high seas sends them to me. Sometimes when Providence is not so kind, I help Providence a bit. Come to the window with me. 
Ramsford went to the window and looked out toward the sea. Watch out there, exclaimed the general, pointing into the night. Rainsford's eyes saw only blackness, and then, as the general pressed a button, far out to sea, Rainsford saw the flash of lights. The general chuckled. <laughs> they indicate a channel, he said, where there's none. Giant rocks with razor edges crouch like a sea monster with wide open jaws. They can crush a ship as easily as I crush this nut. He dropped a walnut on the hardwood floor and brought his heel grinding down on it. Oh, yes, he said casually, as if in answer to a question. I have electricity. We try to be civilized here. Civilized? And you shoot down men? A trace of anger was in the general's black eyes, but it was there for but a second, and he said in his most pleasant manner, Dear me, what a righteous young man you are. I assure you, I do not do the thing you suggest. That would be barbarous. I treat these visitors with every consideration. They get plenty of good food and exercise. They get into splendid physical condition. You shall see for yourself tomorrow. What do you mean? We'll visit my training school, smiled the general. It's in the cellar. I have about a dozen pupils down there now. They're from the Spanish bark San Lucar that had the bad luck to go on the rocks out there. A very inferior lot, I regret to say. Poor specimens and more accustomed to the deck than to the jungle. He raised his hand and Ivan, who served as waiter, brought thick Turkish coffee. Rainsford, with an effort, held his tongue in check. It's a game, you see, pursued the general blandly. I suggest to one of them that we go hunting. I give him a supply of food and an excellent hunting knife. I give him three hours start. I am to follow, armed only with a pistol of the smallest caliber and range. If my quarry eludes me for three whole days, he wins the game. If I find him... The general smiled. He loses. Suppose he refuses to be hunted. Oh, said the general. I give him his option, of course. He need not play that game if he doesn't wish to. If he does not wish to hunt, I turn him over to Ivan. Ivan once had the honor of serving as official nauter to the great white czar, and he has his own ideas of sport. Invariably, Mr. Ainsford, invariably they choose the hunt. And if they win? The smile on the general's face widened. To date, I have not lost, he said. Then he added hastily, I don't wish you to think me a braggart, Mr. Ainsford. Many of them afford only the most elementary sort of problem. Occasionally, I strike a tartar. One almost did win. I eventually had to use the dogs. The dogs? This way, please. I'll show you. The general steered Rainsford to a window. The lights from the window sent a flickering illumination that made grotesque patterns on the courtyard below, and Rainsford could see moving about there a dozen or so huge black shapes. As they turned toward him, their eyes glittered greenly. A rather good lot, I think, observed the general. They are let out at seven every night. If anyone should try to get into my house, or out of it, something extremely regrettable would occur to him. He hummed a snatch of song from the Folie Bergère. And now, said the general, I want to show you my new collection of heads. Will you come with me to the library? I hope said Rainsford, that you will excuse me tonight, General Zaroff. I'm really not feeling at all well. Ah, indeed, the General inquired solicitously. Well, I suppose that's only natural after your long swim. You need a good restful night's sleep. Tomorrow you feel like a new man, I'll wager. Then we'll hunt, huh? 
I have one rather promising prospect. Rainsford was hurrying from the room. Sorry you can't go with me tonight, called the general. I expect rather fair sport. A big, strong black. It looks resourceful. Well, good night, Mr. Rainsford. I hope you have a good night's rest. The bed was good and the pajamas of the softest silk, and he was tired in every fiber of his being. But nevertheless, Rainsford could not quiet his brain with the opiate of sleep. He lay, eyes wide open. Once he thought he heard stealthy steps in the corridor outside his room. He sought to throw open the door. It would not open. He went to the window and looked out. His room was high up in one of the towers. The lights of the chateau were out now, and it was dark and silent. But there was a fragment of sallow moon, and by its wan light he could see dimly the courtyard. There, weaving in and out in the pattern of shadow, were black, noiseless forms. The hounds heard him at the window and looked up expectantly with their green eyes. Rainsford went back to the bed and lay down. By many methods he tried to put himself to sleep. He had achieved a doze when just as morning began to come he heard, far off in the jungle, the faint report of a pistol. General Zaroff did not appear until luncheon. He was dressed faultlessly in the tweeds of a country squire. He was solicitous about the state of Rainsford's health. As for me, sighed the general, I do not feel so well. I am worried, Mr. Rainsford. Last night I detected traces of my old complaint. To Rainsford's questioning glance, the general said, Ennui, boredom. Then, taking a second helping of Crepe Suzette, the general explained, The hunting was not good last night. The fellow lost his head. He made a straight trail that offered no problems at all. That's the trouble with these sailors. They have dull brains to begin with, and they do not know how to get about in the woods. They do excessively stupid and obvious things. It's most annoying. Will you have another glass of Chablis, Mr. Rainsford? General, said Rainsford firmly, I wish to leave this island at once. The general raised his thickets of eyebrows. He seemed hurt. But, my dear fellow, the general protested, you've only just come. You had no hunting. I wish to go today, said Rainsford. He saw the dead black eyes of the general on him, studying him. General Zarov's face suddenly brightened. He filled Rainsford's glass with venerable Chablis from a dusty bottle. Tonight, said the general, we will hunt, you and I. Rainsford shook his head. No, general, he said, I will not hunt. The general shrugged his shoulders and delicately ate the hothouse grape. As you wish, my friend, he said. The choice rests entirely with you. But may I not venture to suggest that you will find my idea of sport more diverting than Ivan's? He nodded toward the corner where the giant stood scowling, his thick arms crossed on his hog's head of chest. You don't mean, cried Rainsford. My dear fellow, said the general. Have I not told you I always mean what I say about hunting? This is really an inspiration. I drink to a foreman worthy of my steel. Well, boys and girls, um, <clears throat> at this point, we have uh, pushed through more than half of the text, quite more than half, but um, it's right around here in the middle that we get to the, the climax of the story. And we're going to talk about that climax here for the last 10 minutes of this lesson and just uh, really try to determine where is it that Rainsford um, has a turning point for this main character. Nice thing about the characters, first of all, only four in this story. We know Whitney is in the beginning, and he is um, he, he's, he's on the ship, the cruise ship that continued on. So we have Rainsford, we have Ivan, the Cossack, and we have uh, Zaroff, who was a general of the, um, of the Tsars in the Russian uh, area there. First thing I want to point out are, are definitely the footnotes, once again, how important those were 
Um, and I'm not sure that I, I pointed this out earlier, but but basically uh, footnote 7 on page 17 talks about Ivan being a Cossack, a member of, from Ukraine, many of whom was served as horsemen to the Russian Tsars, uh, famous for their fierceness in battle. So we got this guy, and then uh, more so this debacle in Russia that happens. Those footnotes are so important so that we know how General Tsarov uh, ended up here. Now, Tsars were wealthy, wealthy people, leaders of the this Russia uh, before the Soviet Union, um, and their families and things like that, their friends were all very wealthy. He got out of there before the debacle in Russia. And it says that he invested in American annuities, stocks, things like that. And by the way, in the 1920s, what's going on in the United States? The Roaring Twenties. So this is before the stock market crashed. This story takes place. The uh, This guy who was wealthy invested in American stocks, and we know that that, that is going up. Therefore, you can afford to buy an island and have an entire um, area on there. Now, did you notice the part I highlighted too? <coughs> I love the point where they're looking at the rocks and he's describing how he gets his game to hunt on this island. And he's like, sometimes they crash into the rocks, but sometimes I have to lead them here. Providence isn't always so great. So he turns on the lights and the channel and he says, they think there's a channel, but it leads them right to the rocks. And I highlighted that point there where it says, I do have electricity. I try to be civilized here. That, boys and girls, is verbal irony, right? The author has us do the opposite of what we would expect. He's like, I am civilized here. Civilized, you're hunting men. And that, But what's really ironic, I want to scroll right up to the top here, where in the beautiful irony that we don't see as irony until we reread, okay? First time we read through this, do we see this as ironic? Um, he goes, great sport hunting isn't it right and rainsford goes best sport in the world at green rainsford uh well for the hunter amended whitney not for the jaguar oh don't talk rot whitney you're a big game hunter not a philosopher who cares how a jaguar feels he goes well perhaps the jaguar does right perhaps the jaguar cares how he feels uh whitney has a little bit of reason that's anti-hunting here but rainsford is the one who's totally like i don't care i'm the hunter not the hunty um not going to be so tomorrow, is it, Rainsford? Because you are going to be the hunty. So he gets a taste of his own medicine. And this, boys and girls here, is beautiful, beautiful verbal irony. But we don't get the irony on the first read through. It takes a second read of the text, a third read of the text, to see all of this. And to see also foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is going to be on your worksheet when we return to school on Monday. But there is one small trait of, that the, of the generals that made Rainsford uncomfortable. Whenever he looked up, from his plate, he found the general studying him, appraising him narrowly. Okay, this is a great example of foreshadowing where the general czar office taking a look at Rainsford, carefully appraising him as a hunter would appraise his game. Always think. So at this time, um, we're done with day one. And um, if you want to move on, you can go right to the second video or you can take a break for a day and, uh, and do the second video tomorrow. Okay, don't forget to comment.